بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جاءته سهلا وأن تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم أسأل الله تبارك وتعالى أن يجعل نياتنا خالصة لوجه الكريم Let us recite Al-Fatiha to the soul of Imam Al-Nawawi رحمه الله تعالى and Al-Sheikh Yusuf Nabhani رضي الله تعالى عنه الفاتحة We reach up to page number 43 in our book Riyadh al-Salihin The Medals of the Righteous Abridged and Annotated This page 43, lesson number three. So what are we learning from this book? We are learning the spiritual side of the Islamic knowledge, which is called at tasawwuf Through hadith, as our teachers explain, the book Riyadh al-Salihin is Sufism at tasawwuf in the garment of hadith. So this book is teaching us tasawwuf in the garment, in the clothing, in the form of hadith. So if you look, of this book, you will notice we covered two chapters already. The first chapter is on Iman, faith, belief in Allah wa ta'ala. And that is the first obligation on the morally responsible person to enter Islam and to have the correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi because no act of worship would be valid until one knows whom he's worshiping so that's the first chapter and if you go to the early books of al-tasawwuf like the risala of imam al-kushayri rahimahullah ta'ala you will notice that the first section that he starts to go in is belief. He talks about the belief of the people of et right? So knowing that the creed in Islam is essential in order for one's deeds to be accepted. So Imam al uh, Sheikh Yusuf Nabahani started with that. Then he went to the matters of the heart, which are al wajibat al qalbiyya, those obligations of the heart. So he talked about al ikhlas and al riya, which we talked about over the last couple of days. Sincerity, al ikhlas. As Al Habib Abdullah bin Hussein bin Tahir rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned in his acting or practicing acts of obedience for the sake of Allah alone. Practicing acts of obedience for the sake of Allah alone. And Ariya is the opposite of that, it is doing things of obedience for the sake of others, 
to be seen and recognized by others. And we talked about that. And al-ikhlas, in reality, is having pure intentions. Right? So it's connected. Having sincerity and always keeping pure intentions. And this is something that you should do in every act of worship. So this is from the matters of the heart. So he gave two characteristics. One is the one you need to remove, a riya, ostentation, showing off. So this is among the blameworthy characteristics that one needs to remove from the heart. And one needs to replace it with the praiseworthy concept, which is al-ikhlas, sincerity. As Imam al-Ghazali, he talked about the reality of a tasawwuf is truly removing ruinous characteristics, removing them, getting rid of, of them, and adorning oneself with praiseworthy characteristics. This is the obligatory part of a tasawwuf. So when Imam al-Ghazali mentioned that a tasawwuf is an obligation, he was talking about that. He wasn't talking about taking a sheikh, for instance, right? Rather, if one could acquire noble qualities and get rid of bad qualities, characteristics, by simply accompanying a good person, then this is sufficient. So if you have a good brother or sister who you could benefit from them and they help you remove those blameworthy points and adorn yourself with praiseworthy ones, that is the tesawuf that you need. But for the one who has is not able to do that by himself or with others, then he should have or she should have a guide that would help one do that. Mm. So now we go to darsun fil qawfi min Allah ta'ala. Right? A lesson in fear of Allah and muraqaba, being aware of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Bismillah. Let us begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, the author, may Allah ta'ala have mercy on him, said, on fear, khawf of Allah ta'ala most high, and mindfulness, muraqaba, of him, the almighty. Allah ta'ala most high says, the day you shall see it, i.e. the hour, every nursing mother will forget her nursling and every pregnant female will drop her load. And you will see mankind as in a drunken state, yet they will not be drunk. But Allah Ta'ala's torment is severe. Surah 22, Ayah 2. And this is talking about the day of judgment. All of us should have our look towards the day of judgment. And I mentioned to you the other day, and it's one of the most beautiful narrations uh, that Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned from the route of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib when he said, today is work, al-yawm al-amal, wa ghadan al-hisab, and tomorrow is reckoning, judgment. Meaning, in this world, al-yawm, we have the opportunity to do acts of obedience. On the day of judgment, there's only going to be judgment and reckoning for the deeds we did in this world. So all of us should be looking for tomorrow while working today. And when we look at a description of the day of judgment, that is the reality. 
if you think of it, just one aspect of it, that the day of judgment is 50,000 years of what we count. And the lifespan of the nation of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is between the average lifespan is between 60 and 70 years. We're going to stand on the day of judgment for every year we live around a thousand years, if you estimate time, right? That's a lot of standing for a little bit of work in terms of your lifespan. So it lets you know that your meeting with Allah Ta'ala is more important to be concerned about than how much you concern yourself with this world. This world should be your harvesting for the hereafter, right? Because these descriptions are telling you what, subhanAllah, this is gonna be a dreadful day. Women will drop their loads. Nursing mothers forget their breastfeeding, their baby. People are going to be in a state as if they were drunk and they're not drunk. It is from the severeness of that day and the punishments So it's something that we should keep in our mind. And it should produce in you a fear that leads you to obedience. Every time you say Maliki Yomidin, this should be in your mind. Every time we say Al Fatiha, when we get to the line, Maliki Yomidin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us a day of accounting for everything we do. And we become unmindful of this matter easily because we're human beings, we forget. But all of us, need to think about death and what follows it. And think about it with the intent of taking admonition from it. Because death is a great teacher if only one attends its class. Death is a great teacher if only one attends its class its lesson and pay attention and take notes. Death will teach you a lot. SubhanAllah, will death teach you a lot? You will learn I think about it often, that everything you possess in reality is going to perish. Whew. Death will teach you that. In relation to death, when you die, everything you possess is going to perish in relation to you. That's it. So its value will only be what useful benefit you made of the things you possess for the, your journey in the hereafter. And this will produce zuhud in you. We talked about Imam al nawi was Zahid. It's going to produce to you some kind of attachment and renunciation of worldly matters. And all of these things 
they're interconnected. One thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. But what it all should lead to in relation to us is being a more obedient servant to Allah Ta'ala. And that's the reality. I read something today, yesterday, not today, yesterday. And it gave me this lesson. No matter who you are, there is a reckoning. None of us are above Allah's justice. SubhanAllah. No matter who we are. SubhanAllah. That's something to think about. None of us are above Allah's justice. While we're living in Allah's generosity, we should never forget His justice. Subhanallah. And that entails us having the proper fear of Allah when we are engrossed in his generosity to never exceed the bounds so that we are deserving of his justice. Allahu Akbar. SubhanAllah. Because his justice is sometimes manifest through his wrath. Through his wrath. His justice is manifest through his wrath. So he gives you endowments and you exceed the bounds and then he deals with you with his justice. Allah. So every time we're in this state of ni'mah, we should understand every endowment is due to his generosity. And that should keep us in a state of shukr. But every punishment from him is due to his justice. And that should keep us in a state of fear. And we're going to talk about another aspect, another wing of that in the next chapter. Now, Bismillah, go ahead. It is narrated from Anas, radiallahu anhu, that he said, the messenger of Allah Ta'ala, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, delivered to us a sermon, the like of which I had never heard before. He said, if you but knew what I know, then you would have laughed little and wept much. On hearing that, the companions of the Messenger of Allah Ta'ala, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, covered their faces and wept, such that the sound of their weeping could be heard coming through their noses. Here, there is an aspect that we should think about here. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ مَا أَعْلَمْ If you knew what I knew. And I want to give you something to think about just that part. He conveyed, so there is the availability for us to know a lot of what he knew. And enough to make us, what? Reflect. And not use this world as play and amusement. You would laugh less and cry more, which is an indication to us, hey, 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 this is a serious matter. Life is serious. And Imam know we knew that as a kid. When they used to go out and they used to play and they wanted to get Imam know to play during the break time in the school, he would leave them and said, we were not created for that. This is a serious matter. SubhanAllah, this is a serious matter. 
even if we're not able to maximize the seriousness of this affair, we should consider it serious, real serious. Give me one second. A, a real serious matter. That's how we should consider everything. Even though we have fun, and I'm not saying life should be just boring and dreadful, no. But even in our enjoyment, we should be reflecting of our reality. It's all going to come to an end. It's all going to come to an end. So even when we realize that, even the joy that we have, right, should be in a way that that joy never turns to regret. So we'll have enjoyment that won't be regret on the day of judgment. So even our enjoyment would be different if we reflected on our end and what we will face before Allah during the times of our enjoyment. Our enjoyment would be different, right? So whenever you want to go enjoy yourself, make a noble intention. Make a noble intention. That is something that in the religion calls for you to have that enjoyment. There's an objective in it. I've learned something myself. I'll share, I'll give you an example. Especially in our communities, many of our people, they're not really, really religious. They're Muslim but they're not religious. There is a difference. You have many people, they're Muslim. But the religious practices and the religious outward stuff, they might not be good at. But they are Muslim and they believe in Allah and his messenger. Some of them pray, some of them fast. Even if they don't pray all the prayers, they pray some prayers because they believe, right? But they are engrossed in worldly matters, whatever they may be. Some halal, some haram. They are in the world. One of the things that we make mistakes, and I'm only learning this as time goes on, when you're responsible for trying to guide people, you realize that sometimes as quote unquote religious people, because we're not that religious ourselves. So I said quote unquote religious people, we become self-righteous. Even if it's unintentional, we become self-righteous and we forget others where they're at. And what the Prophet ﷺ was wise at doing, he was wise at meeting people where they're at. To bring them where Allah eternally willed for them to ultimately be. Because there's a, there's a process in that, right? So we miss this point. Oftentimes, we're just so wrapped up in our religiosity that we forget the humanness of human beings, including ourselves, until we slip and fall on our face, then we realize we're humans too, right? So a lot of times, people are engrossed in enjoyment. If you engross to an extent in their enjoyment, with the intention of connecting hearts to bring them to the worship of Allah. It works. 
It works. Their expression, oh, he's cool, she's cool. Man, ain't so stiff after all. Which brings their hearts to you. Now your heart is to do what? Guide them. You follow my point? I've seen it happen multiple times. Right? So that's in your family too, right? In your friendship, in your dealings, at work, right? Don't be so stiff. This is something we got to learn because we've received religious instruction that took the humanness out of human beings, which is a mistake. That's not the intent of religious instructions, but just the way we've conveyed it, we are guilty of that. We've conveyed it in a way that doesn't allow you to be a human being. It's as if you gotta be an angel to be a Muslim, and you're not an angel, and you are a Muslim, but you're not, and we'll never be an angel. Maybe some of us may reach this high level of piety we would almost look like we angels, but we're not. It can happen. There have been people like that, but we're still not angels. So therefore, there is a humanness in all of us. And our job is to work through that humanness. Right? And connect at the human level with compassion and love, you'll find that you would help people become more religious, even if step by step. A lot of people fail to do acts of obedience, and it's a trick from the devil, because they believe they're going to be judged, so they stay away. You don't want them to stay away. So you gotta remove that feeling from people to the best of your ability. That's a part of a dawah. So one, I think I told you the story one learned man, he was a teacher, imam, and scholar. He was trying to get the youth, but they used to club at night, their version of clubbing, right? At night, they go party, and they used to party on the beach. So they would not come to prayer. So they would be out Isha, Fajr, out partying. So he was figuring, how can I get them to come to prayer? So he made a deal with them. He said, listen, I'll go out to the beach with y'all. If after we go, you come and pray Fajr with me. So this is the sheikh, the imam. So they agreed. So he goes out. They're doing their stuff. They're partying, being you know, all over the place. And he would just go and sit. Whatever was lawful that they were doing, he would engage them. What was unlawful, he would just sit on the side and wait till they finish. Then it would be late because they were hanging out late at night. And then before they would go home, he'd say, come on, let's go to the masjid. Y'all promise you, y'all gonna pray Fajr with me. And he did that regularly with them. Every time they would do it, he would go. And ultimately, they said, listen, man, we got the sheikh, the imam hanging out. We tripping, right? In other words, so they started, because they were coming. They said, listen, listen, you ain't got to do that. We'll be at Fajr ourselves. You don't got to come. You don't have to come. We'll be here. And ultimately, some of them stopped going all together. And they were just, became du'at. They became callers to Allah. Not all of them, some of them, right? But it was a gradual process of engaging them where they're at, right? It was a gradual process.
And in our time, that is even more important. One of the concerns is that many of our youth are not in the masjid. They're somewhere else. We better connect. And slowly, what? Bring them to obedience to Allah, even if it's one step at a time. So, so that's a noble intention while you engage. But do it, even if it's one step. Even if it's just to open the door to talk to some. Even if it's just to open the door. Right? To talk to them. To remove the disconnect. Even if it's just for that point. I want to remove the disconnect so I can talk to this person. I want them to feel some kind of connection. Now, go ahead. Wisdom of the Hadith. In his sermon, the Messenger of Allah Ta'ala, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, alludes to what he knows of the horrors of the hereafter, Akhirah, the bliss which has been prepared in paradise, Jannah, and the painful torment which has been prepared in the fire, Nar. Paradise and hellfire are shown to have been created and now in existence. Here, these are three stages that we should keep in mind. Number one, Al-Akhirah, meaning the day of judgment, right? Which begins when the people are resurrected from the graves and and when the people of paradise and the paradise and the people of hellfire in the hellfire. Right? Before that, you have your life in the grave, al barzakh You have the life in the grave, that intermediate world. And then you have paradise, which is the abode of enjoyment, and hellfire, which is the abode of torture. All of those stages are longer than our life in this world. So what should we be concerned with? That which is everlasting and not what comes to an end. Mm. The Hadith indicates that it is desirable to shed tears from the fear of Allah Ta'ala's punishment and not to laugh excessively, since this leads to heedlessness and hardens the heart. We should note the effect of the reprimand upon the companions, Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, and the strength of their fear of Allah Ta'ala's punishment. Their example also teaches us that it is desirable to cover the face when crying. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Let me quickly remind you of the barbecue coming up. July, the weekend of July 9th and 10th. Where is the thing? La ilaha illallah. Here. Let me wait a minute. That's one way to do it. Um, please, you can register uh, RSVP there. Please do it. So help us that we know how many people's coming. Like, be be just to us. It takes a few minutes to say I'm coming. My party is going to be five, three, four, five people. So we can prepare adequately. Don't you be the cause of us falling short not realizing you're gonna come and then you show up. Let it give us an opportunity to prepare properly and not cause us to waste money by over-preparing. So two, two, two suggestions I have. Number one, register so that we can be prepared to adequately serve you. The second aspect of that, register so we don't over prepare and waste money and resources that could better go somewhere else in terms of a dollar. Is this clear for all of us? Are we all heard me clearly? 
because I'm going to be looking at you side eye if I didn't see you register and I see you. <laughs> Come on, man. Give me a break. Right. Uh, it's important. Right. It takes a few seconds. You have plenty of time to do it. Right. And you should determine if you're going to come by now, especially if you're coming out of town, you should be working on that because you got over 30 days to get a hotel, to arrange your stuff, because it costs money. It's not, Atlantic City is not cheap. So you may need a hotel, you may need uh, Airbnb, you know, what's the Airbnb, is that what it's called? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, you need your resources, so please do it. This is important to me. So I, I try to give of myself for you. I'm asking you to give of yourself for this issue, right? Uh, because I know there's way more people uh, that are coming uh, than have registered. I'm, I'm sure of that. Because I'm coming, but I didn't see your name. <laughs> Why are you coming? I didn't see your name. So please don't do don't do us like that. Our money that we must spend on this is a trust that is given to us to do good things, not to waste. Right? It is a trust. Right? So it's not like we can just do whatever we want. No, we have to uh, be wise with how we do things because people donate. It's not a business. People donate, right? So those donations have to be used properly and wisely, right? And while you're there, you can also donate to help offset some of the costs if you're able. So, you know, just please, I'm gonna I'm remind you every day at the end of the class, but please, and invite your family. We want people to come. We, This is a good way to do da'wah. So you don't have to just have Muslims. Bring your non-Muslim family with you that you've been trying to reach. Bring them. It's a family cookout. So our family is our Muslim family and our extended family, our loved ones. We're trying to reach people. Do da'wah. Make them have a good look towards Islam. Show them that we have fun and we relax and we're humans. Everything ain't, you know, super religious. We can chill and have fun too, right? While doing our religion as well. And believe me, these things are the more attractive than reading books for people. I guess everybody's not gonna read books. Some people are gonna learn from our actions, from dealing with us, from interacting with us, from hanging out with us. They're not gonna read book the first. They're not listening to no lectures. They're gonna watch us. And from being around us, the hearts will be attracted to the religion, right? So, and we people, we're not funny style people. So, you know, bring your family. It's okay, it's fine. They need to be around Muslims. You always around non-Muslims, right? Switch it. Let them get a chance to enjoy being around Muslims. And we're your behaviors and your culture and your methodology is put on, put out front. So let it, let's, let's make it happen. And believe me, we have here one good thing. I'm tell you one good thing. I'm gonna tell you something. I'm telling you about mixing, right? I mix. I used to never mix, seriously, period, at all. I'm getting better with it. But because I mix, when they call me, I usually come. The city laid everything out 
for this cookout. Whatever you need, the mayor, the chief of staff, they like, whatever you want, you got it. Which is huge, right? So they asked about the stage. Not gonna be no stage. We're gonna have a big uh, stage in the auto, I forget what they call it, the auto stage or something. It's a big truck with a stage, microphones, everything huge. Uh, they do concerts with that. They're giving that to us. So no one will fall, <laughs> inshallah, right? Uh, every, everything we need, they like what you need. You got it. But it go both ways. So when they call on me, Imam, we need you to show up, you know, I show up, right? And that's a huge thing. I have some big things I'm going to do with the city of Atlantic City for a dollar. Uh, but those relationships only come by interacting with one another, right? You know, interacting. So it's a wise thing, right? So with all those resources that also your presence helps with our negotiating power to do bigger things because people like numbers, right? When they see that, you know, you're well supported, it strengthens your position as well. When they see you're well supported, it strengthens your position. And in the world we live, Muslims need to have some political influence and power and positioning for bringing about good. You know, people listen to you when you're, you're supported, right? And especially if you're supported and financed, <laughs> it becomes totally different. When you're supported and financed, Allah, it works in this world. So let us do, it's our opportunity to be out front. Let us do a good job, inshallah. Lastly, tonight's round table. This is going to be the round table tonight at seven o'clock. The discussion is going to be on this topic. This is the topic of the round table tonight. And it is uh, an important topic that has come to the front and it's spreading around the internet. And I think we should deal with it because we as a people, especially us as African-Americans have been victimized in this and now I hate to say it like this. And now that white folks are feeling it, it's important. Black folks have been feeling this stuff for decades, right? And I, ha I have a different look at it. And we're going to, we're going to discuss it. I'm sorry, Fatima. I know you white folks. But <laughs> I got to be honest, I don't know how to be another way because, you know, when we going through it, nobody say nothing. And we've been going through it for decades. Now you feel it. It's a big, important. I don't mean you, you 
sister, you know what I'm talking about. When the white folk uh, elite start feeling it, it's uh, it's an issue. But I ain't see you writing nothing when black folks been going through it for all this time. I ain't see letter or article the first, not one. Right, so, but that's that's Iman Amin being bad, bad Iman Amin, right? but true. But it is, regardless of that, it is a serious issue. And my concern is not to talk about uh, the particular group itself because I think that's not really that important, especially for us because we're not in it. So it really like, it doesn't, some of us who are affected by that, I'll leave that part what I was getting ready to say. Some of us who are affected by that, we had that coming. And it's a lesson for us. But most of us are not affected by that at all. But there's extremes to things too. And we got to watch extremes, right? Don't go to extremes. So we're going to talk about this. So this is going to be a hot button topic. Uh, but you know, on the round table, we don't hold our tongues in, in speaking the truth, right? No, because listen, Fatima, I agree. Don't spread slander. Even if it's true, don't spread that. Because you could you can talk about the subject, right? Without even talking about a specific group, because it's abundant, right? You yourself experienced things had nothing to do with that particular group, but the same stuff. Am I right or wrong? Do you follow my point? I've experienced the same thing. It just wasn't from that group, but it's groups. People in our group are going through the same thing just from a different group. So the group is unimportant. The concept that leads to that, we need to discuss, right? And you know, if I told you, the description of fire very well. Won't you recognize fire whenever you see it? If I describe to you fire with a beautiful, excellent description, wherever you see fire, won't you recognize that that's fire? Right? Do you follow my point? If I explain to you fire very well in a descriptive manner, won't you recognize fire whenever you see it? That's it. Do I have to say, hey, that's a fire over there. That's a fire over there. That's a fire over there. All I got to do is describe to you well what a fire looks like, what it feels like, the intensity of the heat, the colors, the how it moves, how it spreads, smoke. What does smoke look like? What types of fires? Won't you, whenever you see a fire, whether it's small or big, you'll recognize that's a fire. So when we talk about cult-like Islamic groups and spiritual sheikh leader abuse, no matter who's doing it, if you know what it looks like, when you see, you're like, that's what they was talking about. <laughs> right? You don't have to highlight any individual. Right? Like for us, all of us in the inner city know what a dope fiend or a crackhead looks like. We don't even have to know what a person is doing or done. We could just look at them and look at the signs. And we know this dude's on drugs, crackhead or dope fiend. And we can distinguish between a crackhead and a dope fiend. 
How many of you from the inner city feel what I'm saying? Can we not distinguish between a crackhead and a dope fiend? We don't even have to know the person. We can distinguish. This one's a crackhead and this one's a dope fiend. By the signs. By the signs. If you come from the inner city, you around, you just look. Dude's a crackhead. Dude's a dope fiend. And we even have, that's a crackhead move, that's a dope fiend move. And they're different. They're not the same. <laughs> a crackhead move a certain way and a dope fiend move another way. We know the moves. That, that's, that's inner city, uh, <laughs> inner city uh, identification skills. So now you should be able, when we finish, to recognize a cult-like Islamic group, and you can you should recognize what Sheikh, spiritual Sheikh, Imam abuse looks like. Because some of us are, would be abused, and I know it, don't know what it looks like. And it happens over and over because we never identified it. That's why it keep happening, right? <laughs> oh my goodness y'all funny okay so that's tonight at seven o'clock uh and it has a context and it ain't just about a certain article i see it all the time we got a lot of that going on especially the cult-like Islamic groups. More than the sheikh abuse, that's not as abundant as the cult-like groups. So all of those things exist, and we're going to discuss them. All right, inshallah, we'll see y'all tonight. Please, everyone register. Spread the flyer. I know we got to go there. The flyer is there on this website. Uh Share it, share the date, put it on your pages, make it one of your backdrops for a couple days, or if you can, to the cookout, so that the word get out. Because you know they have those, I forget what y'all call them, you know, Facebook, they, they control how far it goes uh, and who sees it. So if we spread it and share it, it'll get out, inshallah, and uh, among our people. Barakallahu bikum wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.